Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our 2016 Covey Lecture Series. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Brock School of Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute. Uh, we are excited once again to be sharing with you uh, research on topics spanning the entire grape and wine uh, value chain over the next nine weeks of the uh, weekly uh, lecture series. I welcome uh, both our guests here in person and also all of our online guests that are watching this uh, through the webcast. Today we are proud to present Covey's very own enologist uh, that we successfully imported from the UK, uh, Dr. Belinda Kemp. Uh, Belinda will be talking to us today about Covey's uh, latest research in sparkling wine. Now, Belinda attained her PhD from Lincoln University um, in Enology and Viticulture, uh, which, and Lincoln is in New Zealand, and she specialized during her research on flavor and aroma uh, compounds uh, in wine production. But in addition to uh, that academic research, she also has uh, practical uh, experience in wine production, uh, both in still wine production as well as sparkling wine production, during her time as a commercial winemaker in the UK uh, industry as well as the industry in New Zealand. Uh, so when she joined Covey, she brought with her not only her knowledge base on flavor and aroma chemistry, but also that practical side so that she could work with our industry uh, to help advance our industry. So since uh, joining Covey, she started the Sparkling Wine Research Program here uh, with the first project, uh, leading a project to investigate the effects of various wine-based dosage solutions, so the very tail end of sparkling wine production, and how those dosage solutions uh, would impact wine flavor and aroma. And a large portion of her talk today is going to be focused on that research. But in addition to highlighting that research, Belinda is also going to talk about a lot of additional collaborative work uh, that she's doing and just introducing uh, these additional research projects. Uh, and she does this work with uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Wilworth, uh, myself, and Dr. George Vandermerba. And George is a Covey Fellow uh, Professor at the University of Guelph. And in these other projects, we're looking at uh, grape variety clone effects, soil type impact, uh, press fraction impact, yeast strain impact, protein profile, and the timing and type of uh, bentonite use during sparkling wine production and how all of these factors can in the end impact the final wine quality. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, also emphasize the other part of Belinda's role here at the Institute and that's the outreach program that she's developed to ensure that the knowledge that we're acquiring through the research programs is getting into the hands of the winemakers and the grape growers uh, so that they can input um, uh, these results into their practices. Uh, over two years ago, uh, Belinda started a, a network of area winemakers focused on sparkling wine production and coined the term Fizz Club. And that group meets annually every year to review uh, issues within sparkling wine production and look at ways to further advance our industry uh, here in Ontario. Uh, she also serves on the VQAO Standards Development Committee and the VQAO Sparkling Wine Rules Committee. Uh, so with that, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Belinda for an exciting talk this afternoon. Well, I'm going to um, go straight into this. I'll stand here to the thing. I'm going to um, start straight away. So um, as Debbie said, we're, we're, I'm covering a large um, range of topics today. So let's just have a look, excuse me. So this is the range of topics we're going through. We're going to look at um, some work that Esther's been doing. Esther Onguta is our master's student um, and she's been working with us on a number of projects. So we're going to look at uh, the timing of bentonite addition and there's some interesting information coming out of that. Um, yeast autolysis work that George working on, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what's happened so far, where we're at and what's, what's being done in the future. I'm going to show you some information from the varieties and clones work um, and the impact of soil. We're going to um, explain briefly what's going on with the grape proteins and foaming and the work that's being done again by Esther. 
We're looking at nutrient addition and timing. That's a, a new project that's just started um, by one of our fourth year students, Jesse. Uh, we're also looking, I want to go into more information. There's some interesting um, data and some in, interesting information that's um, come out of this dosage trial Debbie mentioned earlier um, with regards to the impact of sugar uh, on aroma compounds. And we're also um, just going to mention very briefly, I'm not going to go into detail because I talked about these in more detail last year, but just a reminder that we've completed the work on the press fractions that we did for um, local wineries and did the tasting in Fizz Club of all the wines. Um, we also uh, finished a gushing project to find out what the issue was with the wines that were gushing and also the dosage is complete but it's one of those studies, this dosage trial and I'm going to explain <coughs> later that um, just keeps giving more and more and more information and insights and so I'm going to talk about that in more detail and we've got a future canopy management trial um, for sparkling wines here in Ontario so a number of things going on so let's get straight into the first one. Just an overview. Um, this overall project um, is, the, is the project that is a collaboration, as Debbie mentioned, between the University of Guelph, Covey and industry and an industry collaboration. So the funding agency is the OMAFRA University of Guelph Research Programme. The theme we fall under is uh, product development and enhancement through the value chain. There's a number of different tiers and different aspects to this. The title uh, overall is Developing High Quality Sparkling Wine with Regional Identity in Ontario. The principal investigator is George, as Debbie mentioned, and uh, the focus area of George's work is yeast and sparkling wine production. So we've got some interesting information here for you. So let's just take his two obje objectives uh, from, from George's lab, his work is uh, the first one is to identify yeast strains best suitable for the development of quality sparkling wines in Ontario. Uh, and that's quite important because as you'll see a bit later on, um, it's clear that for us here in Ontario, different varieties, different clones have different needs with regards to acclimatization and second fermentation. So George's second objective is to evaluate strategies to decrease the maturation time of sparkling wine. So basically um, meaning that we would hopefully have in the end wines that uh, age quicker on the lees, if you like. Okay, so there's one. On to go into a bit more detail, and I'm talking on behalf of George here. Um, so, uh, and these are information that George has provided for me to share with you today. So let's take objective one. Well, the first, so far, what George has done is he's tested sparkling wine yeast strains for viability during acclimatization and fermentation of the base wine. So he's taken, um, taken yeast that are commonly used in sparkling wine production for second fermentation around the world, not just here in Ontario. So he tested in his lab with a master's student, tested uh, EC1118 yeast, um, DV10, QA23, Laforte Spark, and BC Uva Firm yeast to begin with. And he was looking at a the stand using a standard acclimatization protocol. So that's basically what that means is, is getting the yeast ready and used to the environment of the wine so that it builds up the culture to go into the second fermentation. So what he found was EC1118, QA23 and Laforte Spark completed the acclimatization process or the, or the tiraging, if you like, uh, with 90% viability. DV10 had 86% viability, and that means how viable the yeast were to go into second fermentation. And the BC Uvaverm had less than 50% viability. So the next stage was that he took EC1118, DV10, and QA23, and Laforte Spark, and subjected them, or they went, should I say, they went through a 28-day fermentation in Ontario base wine. And here we had EC1118 and QA23 had the highest viability after the ferment of 74%. The Ford Spark and DV10 had the lowest viability. And um, I know DV10 is used quite a lot uh, here as well. Um, at less than 50% viability. So George's, George's lab is still looking at the performance of EC1118, DV10, QA23 and Laforte Spark 
during the aging process as well. So uh, uh, when I say aging process, I mean on lees in the winery, in the cellar. So here's the next part that he's doing. This is objective two. So George's team have generated wine yeast strains with accelerated autolytic characters. So that means to speed up the, the uh, autolysis of those, lees, uh, those yeast. So henceforth, known as Accult. Uh, and basically, he's been looking at the laboratory characteristics of those and tested them in um, industrial conditions as well, winery conditions. So first, he acclimatized the experiments with EC1118 and with our um, accelerated yeast autolysis uh, strain, um, and they showed similar cell viabilities, or how, many, how much yeast was um, viable after, afterwards, after the acclimatization. Then um, the fermentation of Ontario-based wines also showed similar kinetics using the two strains, um, and that's with regards to how, uh, how the sugar was consumed and the ethanol. Um, and the accelerated autolysis yeast strain uh, showed a decreased viability towards the end of fermentation. So that's meaning that the autolysis is starting to happen a bit earlier. So the ongoing work to carry on to the next stage of this is that the performance of EC1118 and the ACALT strain um, during aging in the cellar, the potential impact of enzyme treatments as well, there are some available on the market in autolysis, that's ongoing, and waiting for two more yeast strains to perform similar experiments to the ones I just showed you. So this is really moving forward and this is going to have a huge impact, uh, meaning imagine if we could, wineries could release their wines earlier from increased accelerated ox um, uh, autolysis. Um, it has a huge impact economically as well as um, financially. Okay, oops, wrong button. So, oh, sorry, how do I go back? Yes, right. Now this, this part of the uh, overall project, um, it comes under, falls under tech. And he's here, he's our uh, Covey Fellow, and he's a Professor of Marketing and Product Innovation um, here at Brock University. Hi, Tech, just over there. Um, so um, Tech was kind enough to supply these slides for us, and he's looking at the sparkling wine marketplace in Ontario for Ontario wines. So um, who, he's looking at who are the potential customers of our Ontario sparkling wines, first of all. Well, the first thing to do that is to identify the important attributes of sparkling wine marketplace, what's happening out there, and then to determine the relative positions of existing sparkling wines being produced in the different regions in Ontario against what consumers are really looking for, here in all Ontario consumers are really looking for, um, in their sparkling wine. So let's just have a look in a bit, little bit more detail um, as the work is underway at the moment. So um, for suitable identification and product positioning, we need, uh, tech needs to understand the consumption values, the consumption situation, so when people are actually drinking the sparkling wine, um, and that can influence uh, all sorts of aspects, that side, and of course, um, this is a bit of marketing speak that tech's given me, so I'll leave that up to him. Um, but also, it also needs to be knowledgeable on how these influences of consumption vary in different consumer segments as well and then also exploring the various options on the product placement map to seek out the optical option respecting purchase price, quantity and frequency. So basically looking at our Ontario sparkling wines in the marketplace here in Ontario. Um, and on to the next one. I'm sure um, Ted can answer some questions as well about that towards the end. So one aspect, and we have many, but one aspect of uh, this project is with regards to bentonite timing. Um, and addition. So um, I know I've, I've shown this slide before, so I've, I'm just showing you this as a reminder to let you know what we did. The first thing was that we started off with two 200 litre tanks. We used Pinot Noir Maria Feld from Trias. We, we collected the juice from them, so it had been through their press um, system, press fractioning system. We had one 200 litre tank with no bentonite in the juice at all, and then we put one gram per litre of Viti ben bentonite, which is sodium bentonite, and then removed it prior to first fermentation. Then we went into more treatments. 
So here we split them up, and so our control is no bentonite. All, this is, all these are with EC triple one eight yeast. The second treatment was bentonite in the tirage only, and that was actually using Enoclear two, which is a commercial product, and that was at uh, 0.5 grams per liter in this particular trial. And then we also had uh, bentonite in the juice only, so no no other treatment. And then we had bentonite in the juice. And then we also had the bentonite in the tirage, so four distinct differences. It's quite interesting. This is quite exciting. <laughs> okay, so at the, at the um, six-month trial, when Esther went and had a look at the chemical composition of it, there's not an awful lot of difference between any of the treatments, um, which is showing us that bentonite, which is quite common in the bentonite studies on sparkling wine that have been presented both in Spain and France, so the, uh, even the alcohol, um, malic's a bit high, but um, uh, everything's fermented nicely. The pressure's not very different. The pH, a bit boring, really, on that aspect, until we start delving into it a bit more. And then the fun begins. So this, is, I'm going to explain this, what this is all about. We did a, used a technique called napping, which is the first time we've used it here at Brock University. And then um, we, I submitted the data, all the data to statistical analysis. And just to let you know, because I know that there are people who are using napping elsewhere, um, we used a, a, a data analysis method called generalized procrastinus analysis because recent papers have shown that that's the strongest way to analyze napping data. And napping is simply a way of tasting a wine, placing it on a piece of paper, so the ones, wines that are closer together are more similar. And those that are further apart are, are different. Um, and basically, the generalized procrustes analysis keeps that distance between the objects. We also let all the panelists, and there were 15 of them, um, use what is known as um, flash profiling, which just basically means you use your own words to describe the wines. Um, and then we, we have fun for a couple of weeks in the, on the computer analyzing the data. So let's have a look. So down here, the, the control, so no bentonite whatsoever, is showing us that they came out on the PCA as being more acidic and citrus. You can see quite clearly that there's a huge separation between the four treatments, even though their chemical composition is no different. The flavors clearly are. This, they were only, for the napping, they only um, separated the wines with flavor, not for foam or aroma, by the way. The bentonite, uh, treatment in the tirage only um, is quite interesting because it's come out here as being more yeasty, autolytic, and a little bit of grapefruit there as well, which is interesting. So completely separated from anything else within the autolytic um, yeasty characters. Over here, the first thing you'll see is all the uh, fruity aromas are on this side. And basically, the bentonite treated juice and also that had the, the bentonite in the tirage is up here, clearly separated from everything else. But down here, next to the vegetal, the bentonite wine treated with, in, um, with bentonite, the wine treated with bentonite in the juice only before first fermentation is sitting down here next to more vegetal characters. So a clear distinction with the timing of bentonite on there. I think the, this part, um, with regards to the effect of bentonite on flavors and yeast autolysis, is something that I have a whole presentation on at the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Convention, and I'll be talking in more detail why that's happening. One of the things at Fizz Club that one winemaker did say that um, they don't use bentonite, and their reason was not for foaming, but it was specifically because they didn't want these fruity characters. They, they want the, the more autolytic yeasty characters to come through. So that could be another way to uh, think about in production how to make a more fruity sparkling wine for earlier release than for one that's aged on lees as well. Now, the other thing to mention with this is this sensory analysis was done three months after dosage um, had been added. It was eight grams per, li per litre of dosage. And why the timing for sensory analysis in sparkling is important is something I'm going to show you again in a moment as well, particularly from our point of view as researchers and scientists as we carry on with these projects. Um, don't, once, the, once the wine has been dosaged, don't do the sensory straight away. But I'll explain why that is in a moment. So we're still analyzing all the data um, on the foaming, and we had a look at the effect of bentonite on foam. 
And you can see, once again, clear categories. So this graph shows us the time that lasts for the dissipation of bubbles, so how quickly the foam disappeared. And you can see here the control with no bentonite took ages. It took ages for the foam to disappear. We actually got quite bored. It got, got to about 10 minutes, I think, and then we had to decide that there was more to life. And, um, but, we, but we actually used a video camera technique, a digital camera, and stopped each of the stills. So there's more data on this with regards to um, how much in the glass was liquid, how much was foam, um, etc. And the, the foaming stability of the collar at the top as well. So that's all data that we're going into in further detail. But let's have a look at number two. So in the, even the, the bentonite in the tuage um, has had an effect here. The bentonite in the juice only, so that pulls up another question we're looking at as to great proteins and foaming, the effect on foaming, not just yeast proteins which again is something we'll uh, talk about. And then down here, the one that's had the most bentonite in the juice and the tirage didn't last long at all. So that's an important prod uh, production aspect as well. So you've got no bubbles, you've got no, no sparkling. So I'm going to come back. Oh, there's just, there was just one thing I was going to say about that, actually, but I'll come back to it in a second. Um, we did use quite high levels of bentonite in the tirage at 0.5 grams per litre. And there's other trials that we've got going on that are we, we've used 0.03 grams per litre. So we've dropped the level down as well. But that's to show you what can happen if you get overzealous with the bentonite and worry too much about protein instability in, in sparkling. So this is um, this has been fun. This is this um, this is the clone grape variety and soil type study. And this is, makes up a major part as well as the bentonite of Esther's uh, project, we're, uh, and we're working together on that. So let's first of all have a look at, we've got four Chardonnay clones, uh, 95, 548, 127, and 128. We've got two Pinot clones, 459 and 386. We've got Chardonnay Musquet on two soils, eight, uh, on sandy soil and clay soil, and they're both 809. These are on the, on the same rootstocks. We've got Riesling, and we've got um, 239 on sandy soil, 239 on clay soil, both on SO4 rootstocks, and clone 49 on sandy soil as well. So we're going to break that down a little bit. How did we arrive at those? Well, we tested, Jim and I tested and analysed quite a few um, uh, great uh, uh, vines across the vineyards, and we talked together with Debbie and we do, we, the choice for these clones was basically from what is common in Ontario, um, their vineyard performance, so disease resistance, susceptibility, cold hardiness, Jim's got some information and data on differences between clones, and the protein levels in the juice because we're obviously um, looking at protein and foaming. So just to give you a little bit more information about these clones, um, the Chardonnay and Pinot clones, by the way, are, are are grown on silty clay soils. The Chardonnay 95 is a Burgundy clone. Chardonnay 127 is in Champagne and Burgundy. Chardonnay 128 is Burgundy only. Chardonnay Musquet Burgundy. Now that gives us a, the Musquet aspect of it gives us the Muscatty um, flavour. Uh, we've got a Pinot clone from Champagne versus the Pinot clone from Burgundy. We've got a Riesling from Geisenheim, Germany, and we've got a Riesling from uh, Alsace. So that's quite big. All the wines were made in triplicate. We were quite busy this year. Um, and so let's have a preliminary look at the clone data. And this is the juice once it's been pressed, come straight out of the press. Um, you can see the bricks levels. The highest was 20, but there's not an awful lot of difference between those. Um, the lowest was clone 128 at 18.8, .8, but only, oh no, sorry, 127 there. Um, the pH, not a lot of difference until we get to the Chardonnay Musquet. That's a little bit higher on the pH. And the acidity was lowest in the Chardonnay Musquet as well. So they all came in around um, 12 there. And a little bit of a difference there on the AM, but not much because that could be supplemented. So a bit boring there, I think, until we get into uh, some of the more. Uh, let's have a look at the Pinot Noir and Riesling. So here you have got a difference on soils on the Pinot, 18.8, .8, a small one, mind you, 19.3, 19.3, 19.4, 19.5, 19.6, 19.7, 19.8, 19.9, 19.10, 19.11, 19.12, 19.13, 19.14, 19.15, 19.16,
little bit of pH difference, so very small, and a bit of tartaric acid difference there as well, between 10 and 9. Um, so let's look at the Riesling. Well, the Riesling is slightly different. The Riesling has a, has a lower pH, or oh, it's not that different to the Pinot actually on this one. Um, the Briggs level is slightly higher, and here we have the tartaric acid levels, um, are, you can see, are visibly lower, and much lower on the yam here as well in the juice, um, with regards to supplementation as well. So we go on to the next part of this. All those wines, by the way, have all been uh, cold stabilised, filtered and bottled and are sitting happily, well we hope happily, um, over at Fielding Estates in their storage for disgorging later on in the year. So let's have a look at uh, the grape protein. We want to find out, and this, this forms a major part of Esther's master's degree as well, master's project, how much do grape proteins really contribute to fining, I'm um, sorry, to foaming. The Italians did a study with regards to Prosecco and they added grape protein uh, in to the, to the Glera wine and found that more foam, uh, or is more stable the foam for longer. But we want to see what this actual contribution is, bearing in mind the industry usage of things like bentonite and things that happen earlier on. So we take the Riesling juice, we separate it into three treatments at the juice stage before it goes into fermentation. So we've got no treatment at all. We use pectinase to settle down, because reasoning needs to be a pectinase, or certainly this year. And then we um, had the pe uh, used another treatment, which was pectinase that has protease in it. Um, but it didn't do quite, we didn't uh, actually pull out as much protein as we wanted. We wanted to strip the grape protein out. So we then use bentonite, um, sodium bentonite, two grams per litre. Okay, so you've got three juice treatments there. Everything happens through, ferm they're all fermented and they go through fermentation in triplicate. Now we get to bottling. And at bottling, these are bottled as normal, so we can have a look at a distinct difference between the effect of grape proteins on the foaming, although, because basically we've stripped it out, so this one, is just yeast proteins, okay? Then we have another set of treatments. We take each of those and then we add a 0.03 milligrams per litre of bentonite now, we've lowered it, uh, in to each of these treatments to have a look uh, at the effect on foaming and how much protein um, impacts the foaming of these. And we'll do sensory analysis as well and uh, see what the effect is on the flavour and uh, flavour side of things as well. And I can answer questions on that, and Esther's around as well, but that's, um, that, as I said, they're all under, in bottle at the moment. Um, so, there's another aspect to this. One of the things that came out of our study on clones and um, soils and things this year was when we came to make the tirages, and it was clear that one tirage recipe doesn't necessarily fit all the juices due to the different compositions of the base wines, for instance, and the clones, even amongst the clones. So um, we have a fourth year student, um, and that could just be for Ontario, by the way, that doesn't, it may, it may not be the case elsewhere, but it was certainly for the clones and the trials that we did across all different varieties. And so we have a student working, looking at um, the nutrient management during tirage and during second fermentation on different clones and, um, and particularly on Riesling as well. And this is to help reduce the yeast stress, improve yeast viability and its health during tirage and then we uh, will go on later on to take that into second fermentation. So we're looking at the impacts of nutrients on yeast cultures, on their health. Uh, nitrogen supplement and the combined impact of both of them, its timing um, and uh, its effect on second fermentation. So Jesse's working on that. So now I'm going to talk about dosage. I've just realised the time. So, um, so let's just have a look at what we did on the dosage. Right. We, we took the brute wines from Trias Winery. They were our partner in this. And we added, made up dosages using these treatments. So without sugar, with sugar. So this is basically where we topped up the wine with the same wine that's in the bottle. Um, we did, used unoaked steel chardonnay, oak chardonnay, pinot, um, the 2009 sparkling, the Niagara produced brandy, and we used uh, Vidal ice wine. All the sugars had to be the same, so everything's eight grams per litre. 
20 mils of dosage were added, and basically the dosage itself, when we were making it up, was actually 300 grams per litre of sugar added to it. Okay? So everything was disgorged at Trias, and the dosage was added, and this was, um, this was also with Casey, who was a previous fourth year student here. And we analysed the wine 5, 10 and 15 weeks after, do after dosage addition to look at differences um, over time between treatments on aroma compounds. This is where the fun starts. First of all, you can see that at the beginning, um, the wines used in, for dosage were all completely different. We knew. So the brandy was obviously going to be much higher in alcohol, and the lowest, uh, sorry, that's in, um, that was highest, yes, the highest in alcohol there, uh, right on the end there, next to you can see how high that alcohol level is. Um, but the residual sugar was obviously lowest in the sparkly wine that had already fermented. Um, so everything was different for all of those wines. And one of the points of this was to show winemakers the impact of doing this. Because when I arrived, we had an awful lot of sparkling wines being made up with all different types of wines going into the dosage. So it was good to collectively do it here and then do a big tasting and show them the impact that even 20 mils of dosage can have on the wines. So. Then we look at the chemical analysis five weeks after disgorging, and this didn't change between 5, 10, and 15, so there wasn't any change between PHTA, residual sugar, and alcohol. These remained the same, so I'm just showing you five weeks. You can see the alcohol is a little bit higher over there uh, in the brandy, brandy dosage wines. The highest pH was in the wine, the dosage that had the Pinot Noir added to it. Um, oh no, sorry, the, uh, the, well the two sparkling wines there, let's have a look, the two sparkling wines that were used in the dosage had the higher pH, um, but there's no difference in titratable acidity and the only residual sugar difference of course would be the, the zero dosage without any sugar. So then we can start having a look at some aroma um, compounds and you can see here that by looking at the wines before they go in to be made as dosage and have sugar added, the only compounds, um, aroma compounds, that were significantly different were these three small chained esters um, and phenol ethanol. And phenol ethanol in the Oak Chardonnay was um, nice and high. Um, but these were the only, only four that were statistically significant. None of the other, um, even though you've got different wines, none, none of the other aromas that we um, analyzed. It might be for other aromas. Um, so there was that difference already between the wines. Then we start looking at some aroma compounds. So let's have a look first at the effect of sugar in the dosage versus no sugar. So this is um, ethyl butyrate, which gives a pineapple fruity aroma. Let's have a look at the dosages. You can see here the dosage with sugar added and with no sugar added are exactly the same. It didn't have an effect on this particular compound. Okay, it might do on others. Um, then we, but remember with these dosage, we've opened the bottles up, we've um, aerated it so much, we've been stirring in the sugar, they're, they're both handled exactly the same, but they haven't had the same treatment as the bottles down here. But the, but the interesting thing is the sugar had no effect on this particular compound. When we start having a look at five weeks, there's quite a lot going on in this information. Um, one of the things that stood out to me, I'm just going to show you straight away, is that at 15 weeks, both sugar and no sugar were exactly the same as, uh, five, as here, five weeks after five weeks of the zero dosage. So all this stuff is happening where the aroma is going in different compounds, up and down, up and down. Well, these three are similar. Five, five, ten, zero dosage and uh, with sugar. These three are similar, but the, these two basically calm down. They've been woken up here, they're all up and all over the place, and then they've gone back to normal, like all of us really, um, but calm back down. So let's, let's just have a look at another compound. There's two here. So this is taking, again, e that bigger chain, longer chain um, ethyl esters, ethyl hexanoate, apple and blackberry, ethyl octanoate, fruity, apricot, pineapple, and if we line these up, let's just have a look at the dosage as well. The dosage with the sugar and um, for the ethyl octanoate, 
you can see there's a little bit of difference, not much, but there is a difference, so yeah, there is a difference in the ethyl hexanoate now. So it might be that sugars is having, sugar is having more of an impact on the longer chained, uh, bigger, higher concentrated ethyl esters than the smaller ones. But um, then we have the same, this same sort of thing where the things are going up and down, up and down. Um, the wine before the, any sugar has been added, it was opened up and analysed. And you can see here it's quite low on ethyl hexanoate, but high on octanoate. But as we go along from, dis, from discordian and dosage addition onwards, um, we end up here, and what we've got, we've got the, t the two compounds here, down here, and in fact these two, two, ethyl hexanoate and ethyl octanoate, return to their former state of when, the, before the wine, before the sugar was added, or the dosage was added. So again, this bears in mind a couple of things. One is that we know wineries hold on to the wines after disgorging to let the flavours and, uh, and aromas balance out and calm down. It also has an impact on when we, as scientists, would do research uh, sensory analysis, scientific sensory analysis. It's not worth doing it disgorging, adding the dosage and doing it straight away. We have to wait. From now on, this will show us that for sensory analysis, um, we do want to do it later on, three months. And even those who release wines from wineries at um, six weeks and eight weeks or four weeks, depending on what the accountants want them to do sometimes, um, you're still not allowing time for these aromas to calm down, settle down and marry in together. Um, so again, these are only two aromas. You can see that even at five weeks for ethyl octanoate, there's not a lot of difference there either. So let's have a look. Let's comparing sugar to no sugar. So let's take a green compound. So this is a C6 alcohol, and this is um, showing you what's happening here. You can see at five weeks, sugar's had no impact on the green compound, on hexanol. And down here, again, by the time you get to 15 weeks, there's no difference between sugar and no sugar. So is sugar really having an impact um, during this time? or on, on aroma compounds, or is it the time itself that the, the wine needs, needs to settle down? And maybe another month would tell us that, um, if we had the time and the money. Okay, so let's now have a look at the actual, um, oh sorry, this one wine, um, I love this aroma. So this is 2-phenyl ethanol, this is roses, this is the final bar chart in this series. And you'll see there's a little tiny bit of a difference here with the dosage when the sugar's added. Um, and then back, but even for phenylethanol, which is in very high concentrations, even that one, um, there's no difference between the sugar added and even at five weeks, it's calmed down. So uh, definitely having an effect, but not for long. At the end, when by the time people get to drink it, hopefully three months later, not an awful lot. Um, so now let's have a look at the different dosage, the different wines used in sparkling wine. I'm just going to take you to the brandy because that's the main uh, one here. Now, there aren't many people that would use pure brandy in a dosage. You, you, there are some who might blend a little bit into something else, but we didn't do blended dosages. We were specifically looking at uh, wine style. And you can see if you add, added brandy, just how high the, both ethyl hexanoate and, uh, eth and hexanol. Hexanol is that green compound we just looked at just now, that, that alcohol there. Um, and then if we look down here, there is a difference uh, between some of the wines, but if you follow this, you need to follow the orange bars for ethyl hexanoate. Um, the biggest difference, well the brewed sugar, the two sparklings are similar on ethyl hexanoate, uh, even, if, even though it's Pinot Noir and this is a, a cuvee, and that goes as well for hexanol. So the sparkling wines are more similar uh, than any of the others, probably because they've been through second fermentation. Let's have a look at a few more. Gosh. So for 2 phenol ethanol, um, this is interesting, this follows the path. You've got brandy has the lowest amount of that uh, rose flavours. The pinot and the vidal are quite similar. The oak chardonnay, whoosh, really high levels of phenol ethanol. The other thing to mention here, and as a remainder, is it might be really high, but how important is it to the flavour? And one of the things down here is with 2-phenylethanol, um, the odour threshold or perception threshold of phenylethanol is 14,000 micrograms per litre. That's, that's in um, ethanol, tartaric acid, uh, glycerol, 
and with a pH of 3.4. So we, you can see that we are well over that up here and in the unoped and in the, and the brute. But how much that is perceived in uh, sparkling wine with CO2 being present, um, that we don't know as well because the, these aroma compounds have not, be, have not had their aroma thresholds or aroma activity values analysed in sparkling wine. And one of the difficulties again with that is when, at what time do you do it? Three months after dosage and at what time in, when the wine has been poured do you start doing that as well because of the CO2? So a nice, nice little job there for somebody to identify the thresholds of aroma compounds in sparkling. Okay, um, let's now have a look at the influence of dosage on the dissolved oxygen levels within the wine. So we can see here, the brut without any sugar, the zero dosage, had the highest amount of dissolved oxygen. And the Vidal ice wine here had the lowest. Um, and then let's look further down at the foam. When we poured the foam and, and used a digital video camera to film it, um, we took stills at each second, then you can see here that the, without sugar, the bridge zero dosage, well the foam took ages to disappear um, compare, when you compare it to the others. So quite a difference on foaming with regards to not adding sugar. You look at the oak chardonnay had, um, was the quickest for the foam to disappear and you'll see here that the Pinot Noir, the sparkling, was the next, uh, well the next longest. So on to the next slide. Let's look, we did sensory analysis, we did a difference test, we chose a, a, an A not A test for the, for the dosage, basically because it's got stronger statistical power than, than the triangle, the duo trio um, and those other ones. So these are the treatments, our control is the oak steel chardonnay wine with sugar, that's because that was the winery uh, dosage at the time. You can see that we didn't include the, uh, I didn't include the, the brute without sugar because obviously it's got no sugar so it's completely different so uh, it can't be compared. So all these wines that went into the sensory have 8 grams per litre of sugar. So let's have a look. Well, what does that mean? Um, it basically means that after a familiarisation session to get used to what the wines taste like, um, we, we did the main session and, the res and we came up with the results, 63 correct answers from a possible 80, means that 74% of answers were correct and we used an R index and that's basically calculated from a sureness rating which basically asks you how sure are you of your answer, are you very sure, are you unsure and you have um, four to six different sureness uh, ratings and our index was 73% for the dosage. So something is happening uh, and basically and this is because an R index of 50 means that the samples are all the same and an R index of 100 means that they're all completely different so 73 percent can clearly distinguish that the wines are all different um, uh, and people are very sure about that as well so let's have a look at what this means well for wineries the time between disgorging and the release of the wine backs up the information that that uh, people are talking about with regards to aroma compounds settling down. Um, the difference or the effect of sugar um, in the dosage and the different volumes of dosage, um, and that will, be, uh, that will be studied in the future. For wineries as well, um, the whole point of this was to consider the balance and the flavour that the dosage adds to the wine. And then for scientists, for us, well, we're thinking about when do we do sensory analysis if we're doing sparkling wine trials, when do we do volatile aroma analysis? Really, it should be, it, depending on what you're obviously um, studying, but if, you're, if we're doing something like bentonite, then our volatile aroma analysis is going to be at three months after, you know, after, uh, oops, sorry, at least 15 weeks after disgorging. Um, and obviously more aroma compounds need to be analysed, so these would be aldehydes, fatty acids and things, because we, we mainly concentrated on a couple of alcohols and esters, small and large chain esters. Um, and of course another difference to dosage would be different varieties in the couvre anyway would have an effect. So that's, diff that's down to uh, balance and flavour again. So just to finish off quickly here, let's just, um, these are all regional specific studies, um, specific to us here. We've completed the press fractions, the gushing work and the dosage work and I've just shown you a glimpse of the dosage work today. 
Um, we have also been lucky enough in that all the winemakers are able to taste all the trial wines that we do at the Fizz Club so that they can see the effect on the wines before and after. And we've got some future viticultural trials that, um, that are underway, um, or just starting I should say, and that's with regards to canopy management in Niagara sparkling wine because we have a shorter growing season uh, here in Niagara even for sparkling, so that's another aspect of that. So just to finish off, Here's our list of acknowledgements. There's quite a large group there, as you can see, um, of researchers within our sparkling wine research team now. Um, for uh, the collaboration and cooperation of the wineries, Chateau de Charme, Trius Winery, and Tours Winery, and for all the help we get with the bottling and disgorging at, um, at Fielding and Melissa May, and our funding bodies that help make all our research possible. And there are references as well that people are interested in looking up and having a read of those aspects of it too. And thank you for all your attention. And any questions, I'll be uh, fielding them uh, outside in about five minutes' time. Thank you for listening and um, hope you found it useful. <laughs>